Okay, let's try another practice exam. Uh, the first question here, we've got uh, some energy diagrams. Given these energy diagrams below for four hypothetical reactions, uh, we want to answer these questions. Uh, there were five, I just chopped it down to four for space uh, by writing the letter of the appropriate diagram. So we want to match the diagrams to these statements. Uh, so the first one says, reaction or reactions proceeding via an intermediate. So if a reaction proceeds via an intermediate, that means there must be at least two discrete steps, right? So every step has a transition state going from uh, starting material or reagent to product, from reactant to product. Uh, but if you have multiple steps in between, you have intermediates. So anything with an intermediate, any reaction with an intermediate, we must see two, uh, at least two discrete steps. So B and D are out. These are clearly one step. But A and C, these work because uh, these have two steps. We've got one step, and then here's the intermediate there. And then over here, we've got one step, and there's the intermediate there. This little local minimum, that little well right there, represents an intermediate. So A and C work for that. Then for this one, possible diagram or diagrams for an SN1 reaction. So an SN1 reaction, let's recall, this is a two-step mechanism. Uh, first, the leaving group leaves, leaving a carbocation. And then the second, uh, the second step is where the nucleophile attacks uh, to generate the SN1 product. And it is the case that step one is the rate determining step. So step one has to have the greater activation energy because it is the less favorable reaction, right? It's, uh, we're going to the unstable carbocation. So that's gotta be C because C has this much larger activation energy, right? This is a large activation energy going to a higher energy intermediate, which is the carbocation, right? Then the second step has a very low activation energy, the nucleophile attacks, and we get the neutral product. Uh, whereas this over here, we have a very small activation energy, and it looks like the second, the second step seems to be the rate determining step for whatever A may be. But that does not work for an SN1 reaction. That one's got to be C. Then this one asks, which one is the fastest reaction? So the fastest reaction is necessarily the one with the smallest activation energy. Because in order for the reaction to proceed, the reactants must collide with the, with the proper orientation and with sufficient energy so as to get over the activation barrier or the activation energy. And the smaller the activation energy, the greater the probability that such a collision will have sufficient energy to get over the activation barrier. So if you have a very large activation energy like this, this is a very large activation energy, which means only one in a thousand or one in a million times when the reactants collide, will they have enough kinetic energy to get over that, that uh, activation barrier. And if they have to collide a million times for every one time that the reaction can proceed, the reaction on a macroscopic level is going to take a long time. But over here, we've got this teeny tiny activation barrier. That means that almost every time that the reactants collide, they will have enough uh, act, uh, enough kinetic energy to get over that barrier. Only if they just kind of slowly graze each other, maybe they don't have enough energy. But if they collide properly, they will uh, almost always have that uh, enough energy. And so if all of the reactants are reacting every time they collide, we're going to, uh, you know, overall, it's going to happen very fast. So this is certainly going to be D. And then lastly, reactions with only one transition state. So the transition state is the little, is the little peak. Right, here is a transition state, here is a transition state. Uh, it, is the, it is the confirmation that must be adopted, uh, which is uh, would, uh, right, it, the activation energy gets us to the transition state, after which point the reaction certainly will proceed. And so which ones have only one transition state? Those are the ones with only one step. And so that has got to be B and D. So that is great, right? We do really want to be able to interpret energy diagrams, draw energy diagrams, know what they mean, identify activation energy, transition state, intermediate, reactant, product, exothermic, endothermic, that kind of stuff. So that was good for that one. Okay, some multiple choice. Which of the following compounds has a non-zero molecular dipole moment? So in other words, which one of these is polar? So PBr3, uh, this is going to be tetrahedral because uh, phosphorus 
is an analog of nitrogen. So phosphorus has five valence electrons just like nitrogen does, which means it makes, uh, well, it can also make five bonds, but it also likes to make three bonds and have a lone pair as it does in this molecule. CO2, on the other hand, those are two double bonds. This is linear. And then CBr4 looks like this. That is, again, tetrahedral. So when we look at these, right, these bond dipoles cancel out. Uh, these bond dipoles cancel out uh, because of the geometry, right? The vectors, if we do the vector addition, if we added up these vectors that correspond to these bond dipoles, uh, they would cancel out and you'd get a net dipole of zero for the molecule. But over here, that's not the case, right? These all point slightly towards the phosphorus and there are, well, they, well, they all point towards the phosphorus and therefore because of the geometry of the molecule, uh, the, the net dipole points slightly up. So that is actually a non-zero dipole moment for that. So we do have to understand molecular geometry as well as something about vector addition kind of. Next one, which cyclic alkane is the largest strain energy? You've got cyclopentane, you've got cycloheptane, which is a little tricky to draw. There you go, seven member ring, and cyclobutane. So when we're talking about strain energy for cyclic molecules, we're asking which one has bond angles that deviate the most from the desired bond angles, uh, which for, for uh, sp3 centers, that's 109.5. Right. So for five, so first of all, that's why six membered rings are the most stable because they allow for perfect 109.5 degree bond angles for all the carbons. Uh, five and seven deviate slightly, but not so much so as to make them unstable, which is why five and seven membered rings are extremely common, uh, even in nature. Uh, whereas cyclobutane, we've got 90 degree bond angles. That is a pretty significant departure from the desired bond, uh, desired bond angles. There is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ring strain in four membered rings, uh, three membered rings even more so. So cyclobutane has the largest strain energy. Now, which of the following compounds is the best substrate for SN2 reactions? Okay, we've got two bromopentane. There's that one. We've got two chloropentane. And then we've got 2-bromo-2-methylpentane. Okay, so which is the best for SN2? Well, uh, let's see. This one's not going to work because that's a tertiary carbon. We can't do SN2 on that. So over here, we're just comparing bromine and chlorine. Bromine is a better leaving group than chlorine because the bromide ion is larger than the chloride ion. It's more stable. So 2-bromopentane is going to be our answer there. Next, which of the following reagents is the best choice to accomplish E2 dehydrohalogenation of 1-bromo? So 1-bromo, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's the nonane and 8-methyl nonane. So we got this. We want to do E2 dehydrohalogenation. Uh, and so what do we got here? Uh, we've got so uh, lithium hydroxide, potassium terbutoxide, sodium methoxide. We don't care about these counter ions. Those don't really do anything. Uh, these The bases are the things that do the deprotonation. deprotonation. So we've got hydroxide. Uh, we've got uh, terbutoxide. And we've got methoxide, right? So which of these is going to be best for doing E2? Well, all of them, they, they have, rel they have uh, almost exactly the same basicity. They're all uh, localized oxy anions, uh, but the sterics play a big difference. And the thing is that very unhindered bases can uh, have competing substitution reactions. So hydroxide, without specifying a temperature, we would expect it to do a lot of competing SN2. We might get a mixture. We could get some SN2, some E2. Depends a little bit on solvent and temperature and so forth. But if we really are set on doing all E2, we want to use tert-butoxide, right? Because tert-butoxide is so uh, hindered, so sterically hindered, that we're exclusively going to get E2. We're going to get that terminal alkene. And uh, so that's definitely the way to go. If you really want to do elimination, you want to use a bulky base because that eliminates the possibility of competing substitution reactions. Okay, next, ozonolysis of the following alkene followed by reductive workup with dimethyl sulfide gives what? So we have this. We're going to do ozonolysis, which means we're going to break 
that pi bond, and this is symmetrical, so we get two equivalents of the same product. What is that product? Well, let's pull that apart. So we're going to keep that. Uh, we're going. We're, uh, we're going to keep the double bond here, but we're going to turn that into an oxygen, right? Uh, and because it is reductive workup, we're going to get the hydrogen here. If it was oxidative workup we would get a carboxylic acid here. But reductive workup, we're just going to get the aldehyde here. So that will be aldehyde. We know ozonolysis is going to cleave alkenes to produce carbonyls, uh, but depending on the workup, we could end up with aldehydes, ketones, or carboxylic acids. So reductive, aldehyde, that's going to be the answer here. Okay, IUPAC nomenclature. Let's do another one of these uh, nomenclatures. So which one is the longest chain? Okay, let's start over here. We've got, uh, we can start with either of these. So let's go here. And now we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Okay, this is the way we want to go. This is going to be the longer chain. So we had to count just to make sure. And what do we end up with? So we've got a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've got a ten carbon chain. And uh, which way are we going to number this thing? Well, if we start over here, that's going to take one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five carbons to get to a substituent. Over here, it's the second one. So definitely, we want to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's the way we want to number this thing. And so we've got a methyl on carbon two. We've got a methyl on carbon five. And we've got a propyl on carbon six. So, uh, <clears throat> um, so what, what do we want to do first? We know that we want to name the methyls at the same time uh, because they're the same substituent. And then uh, M before P, right? M comes before P, L-M-N-O-P. So we want to name the methyls first, which means we're going to say 2,5-dimethyl-6-propyl and then decane. This is a decane because it is a 10 carbon molecule. So 2,5-dimethyl, 6-propyl, decane. This is a, a pretty basic one, uh, just a regular uh, hydrocarbon there. Okay, now draw both chair conformations of the following tri-substituted cyclohexane, and then we don't need to worry, once again, about the uh, getting quantitative with it. Let's just, let's just get the conformations. So here's one chair And here's another chair. So let's draw the substituents. Uh, again, when, when you place the first one on there, that is arbitrary. So I'm going to take this ethyl pointing up, and I'm going to put it there. Ethyl pointing up on the axial, in the axial uh, uh, position. Then uh, now these are not arbitrary. We go to the opposite carbon, which will be this carbon. We've got methyl pointing up, and we've got this uh, CN group pointing down. Okay, so that's that one. Then when we flip it, everything's got to stay on the same carbon and stay pointing in the same direction. So we had ethyl pointing up, so we have ethyl pointing up. Now on this other carbon, we have methyl pointing up, and we have CN pointing down, right? So uh, this, is, this is what we have to do now. We have to compare the, uh, the equatorial and axial groups. Right, so we've got uh, ethyl on the axial, we've got methyl on the axial, and we have CN on the equatorial. Over here, we have ethyl on the equatorial, we have methyl, sorry, uh, oh, I made a mistake over here, let me fix that, whoops, not uh, this one, erase. This was actually methyl on the equatorial and CN on the axial. Over here, we have ethyl on the equatorial, we have methyl on the axial, and we have CN on the equatorial. So, what we want to compare these. First of all, we have two axial, one equatorial over here, two equatorial, one axial over here. So, this is probably better because we have more groups uh, in, equi uh, in, in equatorial positions, right? And not only that, the bulkiest one is definitely ethyl, 
Ethyl is the bulkiest, so there should be the highest premium on that being in the equatorial position. Uh, and then we have methyl and we have CN. These are maybe somewhat comparable. Methyl might be a little bit more sterically hindered because of the shape. Uh, CN is a little bit more bullet shaped. It's very linear because of the triple bond. But nevertheless, we do have two equatorial substituents over here and only one axial as opposed to two axial, one equatorial. So this is almost certainly going to be the more favorable confirmation. So that's the more stable chair, and that's it for this one. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.